Um, so I don't get the opportunity to talk about, I guess, my my story uh, very often. I guess most of the times we're talking about different things as elected officials or just uh, in the different capacities of the work that I have done in the past and uh, just some of my experiences. So this is really a great opportunity where I'm focusing on a subject that it, it's kind of, or majority of it is all personal. And, so, so for me, it's a little bit different because when I'm talking at different events, I'm talking about different issues and different things that you know you could say really impact everyone and everyone in the community. So this is really a great opportunity to kind of explain and to kind of talk to you about my experiences and some of the experiences I've seen others uh, share throughout my professional work career. So for those uh, of you who've heard, you know, I'm from Sudan. So I came here when I was eight years old as a little boy. And you know, I came here with my mother and my older sister. And you know, we left Sudan, and at that time, uh, when, I guess still today, there was a lot of challenges in our country, political, uh, there was war even before I was born, there's still wars in that country. Um, so, so when we first came here, there was a lot of burden and a lot of fear and questions and answers and that my mom was hoping to have when she got here. And so there was a lot of tension there, and I felt as her son, and you know, just because of the culture we came from, that I had to protect my mom, and it was my job to look after mom. So I would always hold her hand as we're going everywhere and looking around. But at the same time, you know, my mom had another responsibility was to make sure that we were safe, of course, because you know, I'm short now, so you can imagine how short I was back then. So I wasn't one of the tallest folks. So, but that being said, you know, it was when we first got here, and the first Canadian I met was a border officer. And, and that first interaction, and that first experience, really did plant the seeds for my entire future and everything that I would hope to aspire to be and everything that I would do. And it really goes to show how important you know, we do have a face of Canada and how important uh, we have that diversity on different levels and that people have an understanding and I think that's what a lot of times you hear Councillor Usher speaking about the importance. Uh, you know, when I used to sit in the gallery and hear him talk about diversity, I understood it, I got it. And, and now I'm in that position where I'm hoping to also educate and to also raise that awareness in the community so people understand that there is challenges and that there is barriers and that we all have uh, responsibility for one another to make sure that we are able to move forward. So when I first got here, and we showed up to the counter and I'm sure I'm looking around the room I see a lot of diversity here so you see that person in uniform and everyone's kind of just tense at that moment but somehow of course my mom barely spoke any English or didn't understand anything at all uh, with you know Canadian norms or anything and somehow he was able to make her smile and when I saw my mom smile and that was one of the first times I seen her smile in a while that made me feel a different kind of feeling that I haven't felt in so long and I felt comfortable I felt safe and I felt welcome for the first time in so long so I always said to myself in the back of my head as I was growing up that one day I want to be that person who now welcomes new immigrants and refugees from around the world so I eventually got to do that but before I jump to that part um, you know I really felt indebted to Canadians growing up I really felt like I owe Canada everything that I have so I set out to make sure that I could give back in any way possible. And you know, being a young boy and army stuff and things like that were floating in my head. And you know, just that sense of pride and patriotism that I really had, I felt that that was the venue for me and the avenue that I would need to go to fulfill and to start to pay back some of the debt that I know till this day that I still owe to Canadians. So that's why I decided to join the Canadian forces as, such, as early as possible. And that's why I felt it was important at that time. And, and of course, Canada, when I was growing up, had a reputation for being those people uh, to go to other places where a lot of people wouldn't go to make a difference in communities, to be peacekeepers. And that's the Canadian forces that I knew. And that's what I wanted to also be one of those per people to make an impact. So I decided to do that. Of course, you can imagine the apprehension my, my mother had uh, when here we are trying to leave one country where wars and military and all those things is what we're trying to get away from. Uh, so I didn't tell her when I joined <laughs> right away. So until this day, she's a little bit mad at me. And, and you know, fair enough, I, I get it. But I felt that that was something that I had to do and that's something that I couldn't live with if I didn't do that. So I went ahead and did that. But if I could backtrack a bit and talk about before I even got to that stage in my life, when I first arrived here 
and the integration and, and trying to to feel, or let's use the word Canadianized, that actually is a word, and it means to assimilate to a pattern of life and interests distinctive of Canadians. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine being a little boy and trying to figure out what, what does it mean to be a Canadian, you know? So I turn the TV on, I see the guys and girls that I'm going to school talking about hockey, so I'm like, okay, let me talk about hockey, but I'm not interested in hockey, so, you know, so I didn't have a passion for hockey. You know, Tim Hortons was a big Canadian thing, so I tried to go to Tim Hortons and get the Tim bits, and to, because I really was searching for that identity, because when I got here, and uh, you know, some of the schools that I went to at a very early age, and I think a lot of you might appreciate it, being parents and, and your children, uh, sometimes might be the only person uh, who, who has a diverse background or comes from a, a different place. And at that time, I was the only kid uh, who happened to go to my school that was a visible minority. Um, and I remember that. And I remember being the only black kid in school. And my sister was a few years older than me, so she was in a different grade. So, um, you know, it was nice to be able to go home and talk to my sister. But when I got to school, and people would talk about experiences, people would talk about Christmas, people would talk about getting gifts. What did you get for Christmas, Mo? Uh, nothing, we don't celebrate Christmas. What do you mean you don't celebrate Christmas? And, and all those kind of things, you had to really try to explain to people. And then of course, we're in Ramadan right now, so that means you're fasting. Um, and people try to understand why you're not eating. And, and, and of course, when you're a younger child, of course your friends try to make it as challenging as possible it is for you, and eat in front of you, right? So uh, those are those experiences. So I always always fought, you know, and, and try to figure out how can I feel Canadian, be Canadian. And after many, many years, it wasn't until I think, you know, you know, I was an adult where I recognized that being Canadian, you know, because when you turn up, when you turn on the TV, there's so much things that are, you know, U.S. and American identity, American culture. So Canada is really this place that I've come to realize is just uh, everyone and anyone doing whatever they feel is right and just being proud to be here and appreciate the land that they're in and willing to contribute and make a difference. And I feel that that is kind of what it means to be a Canadian for me, is just being peaceful, being someone who wants to work and respect their neighbors and continue to volunteer and do things like that. So that's why I went and did a lot of volunteer work and, and I was a Boy Scout. So I, I joined the Boy Scouts before the Canadian Forces because, you know, that was an opportunity for me to also kind of give back and I felt that that was like maybe a little bit of pre-training for me to learn how to do like knots and stuff like that. <laughs> so, so that was a, definitely a great opportunity there. So eventually I got to the age where I was finally able to do that and, and join the Canadian Forces and it was great because here I was where I would only live in, you know, I lived in a number of cities, whether it was Kitchener, London, a little bit of time in St. Catharines, and just kind of different places in the province. And also I had to spend uh, some time in the U.S. as well, which is, is a whole other story and a whole other experience in and itself because they really take that melting pot thing a little bit serious over there. So uh, it, was, it was great to be here because there is a significant, diff a significant difference. So when I got here, and now I'm used to being in very much urban cities because if you look at the demographics and you see immigrants, we go to big cities where there were eventually, as I was growing up, you start to see other di other people in high school who are diverse, who are coming from you know Eastern Europe, who are coming from China, different parts of the world. So it was really interesting. And then I joined the Canadian Forces, and they're like, okay, go to Cold Lake, Alberta, or go to this small town. So there I go again reliving those experiences of being the only person who's different, being in a place where there's no mosque, there's no halal food, um, uh, you know, there, there's not those things that you've come grown accustomed to with being in a major city. So, so then again, that was another challenge for me. So as I went, you know, and then the time when I decided to join the Canadian Forces, of course, was uh, after September 11th. So you can imagine a young guy with the name Muhammad. So there's no secret with that, how challenging that could have been. But I kind of did some soul searching and kind of did some reflection because, you know, when you turned on TV and you saw news stories and you'd, or you'd watch those army movies, and of course it was American movies, so you'd see the stories about how here's this person who joins the army and they're different so everyone's picking on them and being a bully and things like that so I recognize that going in that there might be some challenges and I won't deny the fact that there wasn't challenges but I felt it was important that I was gonna still go ahead with that and face those things because I felt strongly about it um, and then I remember meeting uh, former Governor General Michelle John so just before I joined the Canadian Forces when she finally became uh, Governor General uh, just two months before I joined 
And then now I'm thinking to myself, well, this, this is a lady who came here as a child, as Haitian refugee. Now she's technically my commander in chief or soon to be my commander in chief. So she is my boss. So as a, as a young man, I'm thinking, okay, I think people are going to be accepting of me because there was someone there. And in the past also, I've met people like Lincoln Alexander, uh, the late Lincoln Alexander as well. And to see those people and see that representation and to see those people taking those roles made it made me feel a little bit more comfortable about some of the endeavors that I wanted to do. And of course, when I got in, it was it was very challenging, you know, telling people, yeah, this is my story when they ask, because of, when you join the army, it, it's weird. You actually have to like write a little biography about yourself and stand up like this. And this is my life. And this is, and you're talking about, you know, Sudan. And again, still people don't know where Sudan is at that time. It wasn't until Darfur uh, really put Sudan kind of uh, on the map, if you will, to put it in those uh, light terms, unfortunately. Um, that people started to talk about what was going on in that part of the world. And then people, when I'd say Sudan, I'm like, oh, you're from Darfur. And that's, that's all they knew about Sudan, right? Um, so I think those parts were, were a lot of learned experiences, and there was a lot of stigma, and, and just being a refugee. Because even when I grew up, I felt, I felt that just saying the word refugee as a child was like, people looked at you differently. It was, I could say the word immigrant. And people still looked at you differently. But when you said refugee, then it was even more so a, a bigger stigma and something that you try to, as, as a young person, to really get away from and say, no, 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 I, I, I'm just an immigrant, you know, I, I'm, I'm different or whatever. And, and right now, when you hear me, I don't have any accent at all. So I'm, I'm a lot more uh, fortunate, you know, in that sense uh, than my mother, uh, who does have an accent, who, who, you know, she does cover her head. So she's a lot more visible than I am. Uh, and I, people, I could probably pass and say, oh, yeah, I was born here. And no one would even question me about it. Or I could say, yeah, yeah, I came here as you know, whatever, uh, immigrant, and no one would ask anything about it. But I, I think it was important to be honest with myself as I grew up because I realized that there's so many other young people who do look for someone who that they feel they could be connected with and say, okay, I can do these things. I can be someone in our community who can make a difference. And it, and it really reminds me of this one time that there was a time in London a couple of years ago, if you remember, there was uh, the gas plant attack in Algeria. And that was difficult for the London community and the Muslim community here because for whatever may be the reasons, uh, people felt, you know, and, and I was one of them, you know, like, like why, why should I feel guilty? Uh, you know, I didn't do it. But there was people in the community who felt like we did something. We had a responsibility. And of course, I felt responsibility to speak up and to say, of course, this is wrong. And of course, this is something that doesn't represent the majority of us. And I had the opportunity to speak at the Islamic Center at that time. And I remember speaking, and I think there was 500 people there from the community and people from outside the community. And uh, you know, I remember looking at Imam Munir al Qasim and seeing him making eye contact with him when I was talking. And I could see the, the you know, that he was proud that I was able to get up there and, and still talk about it, saying, you know, I'm proud to be here. I'm, I was a former member of the Canadian Forces, and I'm proud here. And I remember seeing other members from the Muslim community who talked to me and say, thank you for speaking up and thank you for taking a stance. But that was all great. But the, the part that really hit me home was when I was kind of almost on my way out, and this little boy pulled my hand and he said, and I know he didn't know what was going on on the stage because he was so young. And he said, hey, my name's Muhammad, just like you. And I want to do what you're doing, right? And that, for me, has always kind of been something that's been in the back of my head whenever, whenever there's that weight. So, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I try to hold it in. I look a little, try to be tough, but uh, I guess I'm not. I think that, you know, um, during my campaign, there was many challenges. So, sorry. So. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So during my campaign, of course, there was many challenges, you know, sometimes dealing with racism. But uh, I used to think about little Muhammad. I used to think about the fact that 
even though maybe I don't want to do this, because when you get all those phone calls and you try to be strong in front of everyone, you can't like, <laughs> and you know, you try to be a role model for your, your younger siblings and everything like that. But of course that gets to you. And, and that's part of the challenge because you want to keep going. And I mean, I could go and talk about every day the challenges that sometimes you just get just because you're a little bit different and you try to do the right thing. You know, this week I, I decided to speak up against some um, street checks. I said I didn't feel it was right. I didn't feel it was a thing that we should be doing here in London whether people agree with it or not. And you know what, I've worked in law enforcement for many years myself. And you know, the reporter, when she asked me, you know, Mo, have you ever had street checks or done on you or what have you? And I said, you know, I don't wanna talk about me in this conversation. I wanna talk about the fact that this is something that impacts everyone else and I don't want the story to become about me. So, I didn't talk about how many times I had street checks or how many times I've been stopped throughout the province. Because for my work, of course, I travel a lot. So I've been stopped numerous times, of course. You know, I try not to count, but I've been stopped 15 times since my adult life in London, in Toronto, on the OPP. And I know my rights and I know everything that I'm doing. So, but I didn't want anyone else in the London community to ever feel as if they're doing something wrong when they're not. So I didn't feel it was right. But I knew going in that I get criticism. I know there's people who are gonna keep calling my phone, leaving messages, sending emails. That happens. That comes with the territory of being a counselor. Every time I know I take a stance on anything, you're gonna get people who of course are gonna criticize you, whether it's on the free press comments, the AM 980 news. But again, I just stop and pause and I think a little Muhammad and what he wants me to do because I want him to continue to succeed and I don't want him to ever feel like he can't be anything he wants in this community. So, so that's why I continue to do it. So, sorry, I got a little <laughs> watery there. So I think to get back on track a bit, I always felt that sense of duty. So I'll always take a tough stand on a number of issues, whether people agree or disagree. I think it's important because What's fair is fair and what's not is not. So it was really an honor for me when I first became a border officer because every day I got to meet anywhere between 500 to 1,000 people. And you'd hear from immigrants, you'd hear from refugees, and you'd hear their stories. And every day I'd relive my own experiences. And, and every day I'd hear stories that were worse than mine, that were more difficult than mine. And as you know, I'm not sure how many of you here ha have you know, stories of your own, but I'm sure we all have stories in different ways. And you have to hear these traumatic experiences. So it's, I appreciate everything that's the conversation around the mental health issue, a part of it. Because when I first started my job, that wasn't a conversation that a lot of people were talking about with the trauma that these immigrants were really experiencing. But I recognized it because I understood it was, it was difficult for people to integrate. And then the other part is the cultural aspects that a lot of the communities come from, whether you're from the Middle East, where you know you have to be tough and you you know you can't be crying on stage like this guy here. So I'm in Canada, so I guess I can do that. But uh, but you know so 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 there is those difficulties and people being able to express themselves. And I think it's important because if people don't talk about it, you have those instances where those children and I do have those very strong fears when I see you know people coming from Syria, from Iraq, and those young boys and girls who've seen horrible horrible things and now are here and they don't have as many opportunities and now they have to face those challenges in integrating in the community and you have that gap in that intergenerational conflict and you can see it in different communities whether it's you know the Somalian community which came here in the 90s and you hear about the stories in the Dixon community in Toronto and the challenges they have there and, and how to make sure that you know, you don't have youth getting involved with crime or ethnic gangs and things like that. So it's important for a number of people from all sides to really become involved with this conversation that's really, really needed. So 
I think it's also important that at the same time, and I know this is might come up during your uh, the forum today, when you talk about the importance of all the stakeholders that are involved with this conversation, whether it's um, practitioners, researchers, whether it's just government officials, it's important for everyone to genuinely understand and to really get it. Because at times, you know, you know, at times it's hard to understand people's situations. You know, when my sister talks about her challenges as a, as a visible minority and a woman, and, and like if I ever feel I didn't have something to complain about, I think about my sister. She has an additional obstacle uh, in addition to what I have, which is she's a female, so she has those extra challenges to deal with in this world and to navigate. So I can never really fully come to appreciate this, the struggle she has, but she's a very strong woman, and I'm very proud of her, of course. So, um, you know, I think it's, I think we need to have a number of conversations in our community here in London, and, and we really need to find ways of being leaders, because in 2014, the Conference Board of Canada gave London a C for immigration and welcoming new newcomers. You know, compared to, for example, Waterloo, which was a B. So I know and I recognize that we have a lot of room for improvement to really make sure that we continue to be a place where people want to come here and people feel welcomed. And that stigma and that reputation that we have once we get on the 401 and what people think of London is, is, is something that we have to face and something that we have to fight back. Because the reality is, I know, even though I had challenges during my campaign, you know, I ran against four other people, but the reality is, you know, I won with 53%. So what does that mean about London? That means that London, and I know the majority of people that live in my ward, were people who were here for many generations, were people who are veterans and seniors, who were people majority were Caucasians, and they didn't care that my name was Muhammad. They didn't care that I was Muslim. And you know what? If you remember, if you think back, the weekend before I was elected, the big weekend before the election, was when a significant terrorist attack in our country on Parliament Hill. And yet people still decided to vote for Muhammad on that ballot. So I really applaud the London community for, for, for really saying that it doesn't matter who the person is, it's what they bring to the table. And that all is, that's all that matters. So I think that London, and when I look to my colleague, Councillor Usher, me and him alone, we make up 13% of, we raise the numbers to 13% of visible minorities on council. A lot of other cities can't say that. You can look at Toronto where they only have one black uh, city councillor. They might have an, uh, an Asian gentleman as well and things like that, but you look at other municipalities. So we're ahead of the curve in a lot of ways but we still have a lot of work to do. How I tell people when I'm in Toronto or in different cities about our city is that London's just vocal. Whether they're vocal in the regards to being positive and making a difference and wanting to plant more trees and more bicycle lanes, or whether there's people who are just not happy and don't want to see things move and just a very draconic way of thinking, that's what London is. It's just that people are really, really vocal and people are willing to, to speak up, which is good. Um, but at the same time, when you get 20 people who are saying really nasty things, well, I guess, it, you know, sometimes it does grab headlines outside of our city and people recognize that. So I think there's a lot of room for improvement there. But I think as long as we can be the louder voice, that we know that that's the majority and that's all that matters. And we can really send a message because I've had so many issues when I was a border officer and I talk about... Um, you know, and you'd ask the person, well, what, what city are you planning to go to? And they say, Toronto, Vancouver, uh, Calgary. And I had people coming from all over the world. And then I'd say London. And most people would say, where? I never heard of London, England? No, no, I want to come to Canada. I'm like, no, London, Ontario. Have you ever heard of it? And I, and I always have conversations with people because you're just trying to build a relationship and, you know, make people feel a little bit more comfortable. Because the first time you see me, I'm wearing a vest. I have all this stuff on my waist. and you know, and I'm saying, and everything, you, you know how it is, right? So, <laughs> I don't have to explain it to you. So, a lot of people are very apprehensive and, and don't trust me at, at the start. So, I try to have conversations just very casual before getting into the nitty gritty of 
Tell me exactly what happened and why I should believe that you're a refugee. Tell me the story. Tell me the, the most pressing and the most challenging part of your story. And you have to listen to it. And there I am writing notes. That that happened to you? Okay. And then this and that. And it's, it's hard even for me to, to absorb that information. So I think that when I say London, Ontario, they, they don't know it. And then the ones that do know it say, well, yeah, I Googled it. And I remember you guys threw a banana at somebody one day at a hockey <laughs> rink. And, and that and that's the, that's the struggles we have. And I try to tell them, you, you know, I'm from London, right? And they're like, really? Why, why do you choose to live there? And I'm like, because it's a great city. And it's a place that I love. My neighbors appreciate me. The, uh, people are welcoming. If, if I don't get to cut my grass, someone does it sometimes for me. So I mean, uh, you know, and that's part of life. So, so I was really able to be an ambassador and try to sell London as much as I could from the inside because there is that struggle that when people just Google the city and that's what people now do nowadays, right? So I think that we need to recognize that because that's part of the conversation that needs to be had. So. That's why all levels of government be, need to be uh, appreciate the fact that we do have challenges. And I find sometimes that resources go to just those big cities. But then people sometimes forget that once someone gets to Toronto, they stay there for a week or a month or what have you, and then they're like, I'm going to go to London because housing is more affordable there or because my sister's there or this and this person is there. So they decide to go down that route and really decide to call London home or for, for whatever may be the reason. And sometimes you just get pockets of communities. So I'm from the Sudanese community and then for whatever reason, there's a lot of Sudanese people in St. Catharines, Hamilton, and London. But if I go to like some city like, I don't know, uh, Aurora, you know, or something, uh, Northern Ontario, Northern Tor north of Toronto, you don't see people from the Sudanese community. So there's a reason why sometimes even people who decide to go outside of the center cities choose other cities because there was someone happened to decide to be the pioneer and first go there and say hey this place is good and everybody starts following that person and that's where you get sometimes communities and I think you see that with London with the Lebanese community it's a big community here as well and you see a lot of Lebanese who happen to live on the west side of town by chance so <laughs> I think I think you know as a refugee, and what I say to people who haven't had those experiences, it's sometimes a hard conversation to have, and sometimes people don't tell the stories. You know, if you put my mom up here, she wouldn't she wouldn't tell you everything, and she knows a lot more than I do. Until this day, I don't know the full stories and everything that I want to know. I know that there's still people back home that I wish they had the same opportunities I have. So I try at every opportunity to never take anything for granted, to really continue to contribute and to recognize that we're very, very fortunate to be here. And, and everyone here who was here before me, you know, I'm so thankful for you for opening your doors because it makes the world a difference. And I know that, you know, there's always been this perception that sometimes when immigrants come and refugees come and you think that there's this drain on, on this, the economy and this, this belief, but there's not. Because if you look at all the cities that have thriving economies and cities that are doing well, they have that diversity. And diversity and immigration is so key. And if you're not having that growth and you're stagnant, then you're, you're going to be left behind. And now we are at that stage where London, and I'm, I know I'm elected official, so it, it might not be something that is easy to say, but I recognize it as we need to do a lot better because we need to make sure people are continually coming here. And I know people will say, well, there, oh, there's no jobs even for the people here that are here today. There are some jobs. We have areas, you know, in the tech industry where folks we are, are, are fighting over people to work in these industries. And then when you have more people who are shopping and doing all these things in your community, it, it really starts to generate the economy. So we really need to have that conversation with the greater community to say that immigration is something we should be embracing. Because if you don't have it coming to your city, you're really left behind. You look at New York, you look at LA, you look at all those big cities, they have immigrants coming, they have people coming to their cities. And you know, London needs to step up, we need to do a lot more. But I'm, but I'm encouraged because I know that there's people like Councillor Usher that, that are strong and continue to speak about it. And I know that there's other colleagues around the Horseshoe at City Council that are strong and want to make a difference. Sure, they, they're asking questions and want to be more informed and educated and understand it, 
But you know what? In our strategic plan, Harold Usher, without a, without missing a beat, he'll tell you diversity. Did you did you get the diversity piece? And and that's important. So you know we're talking about roads, okay? You know diversity and things like that because it, it, it is important. And people take sometimes for granted the importance because if you're if you haven't had that lived experience or heard the story from someone else, you forget. And I and I and I say this because fire. The first firefighters that I met were coming to my house. And the reason for that was, I, I don't know what it's called in English, but Bahor, uh, which is this thing that you, you, you see. Incense. Incense, there you go. <laughs> and you're, and you're, you're creating smoke in the house. And we have this thing on the wall back in the day, on the ceiling called a f smoke detector or what have you. And, and my mom didn't recognize what that was for the first few times when she decided to light this stuff up. And then the smoke detector is going on and we don't know what to do. And she's just like, what's going on? So of course, who shows up? The fire department. They're like, where's the fire? And she's like, what fire? She, and they're, they're like, why are you doing that in here? And, and people forget, and, and, and of course she did it a couple more times because the communication piece wasn't there because fire departments at that time didn't recognize that she was doing this not because she was just trying to be malicious and start some fires inside, but because this is a norm where you would do that back home. And, and of course there wasn't a smoke detector inside. So I think that's when the role of government and uh, uh, leadership managers and fire chiefs and things like that need to understand that because when they go and train their uh, frontline workers and when the frontline workers aren't reflective uh, and understand diversity or come from diverse backgrounds so they could communicate with the people that they're trying to help in our community, it does pose those challenges. So it is imperative for the people who work in public service to either recognize it or to really be reflective of the community that they serve because if not, the job is even more challenging and then you're going to calls that you don't need to be there at because you could have just told someone that you don't do this inside here and these are the reasons and people can get it. My mom doesn't do it anymore, so don't worry about her. But those are part of the things that happen and I know there's different communities and you know I look at my ward and it's very diverse and sometimes I knocked on a lot of doors and during my campaign and I sometimes people invite me inside and they'd be doing something I'm like ah yeah you, maybe you shouldn't be barbecuing inside right and, and, and so like so there is still that education piece that needs to be done and I think that's that's the importance and that's why it's so good that when you have um, people like myself and Usher and others who when we're talking to the fire chief when they come in and and when we're doing the strategic panel plan and the managing director for child and fire services is listening to us and we're saying these stories and sharing these stories with them and then they say okay we get it this is why it's important how do we enhance um, that fire prevention piece and that communication and education piece so that's why it's so important for everyone to be talking to each other because if one person is doing one thing and the others are doing other things, it really just it just makes it, it doesn't really bring the progress that we're, we're all hoping to have. So, you know, it's really been, you know, an honor to date to serve the London community and it's, it's so such a privilege. So I'm, I'm really excited to be where I am today. And, and I'll, I'm wrapping up, so don't worry. I'm not gonna put anyone to sleep. Um, you know, when I think of myself, when I first arrived here, I had small dreams, you know. So I first came and I said, let me dream about something small. I, wanna be, I knew I wanted to be a border officer. I didn't know what it meant, but it was in the back of my head, like I said. But my small dream was, okay, first, I just wanna be safe. That was my first dream. That dream happened. And then, you know, I had a few dreams along with it at the same time, make sure, you know, I always dreamt of maybe having my own bedroom, but that, that never happened. I always had to share it with my sister. Um, but those were the small dreams that I had growing up. And then there got to a stage after I became a border officer and I kind of looked around and then I was just like, and I kind of, everything I dreamed of doing, I did. And then I, and then I really started to think and I was like, well, I need to keep dreaming, right? So that's where I started dreaming. And then that's when kind of, because working in government and seeing that sometimes when people don't uh, recognize the importance of diversity and different perspectives, I wanted to bring that to government. And that's kind of one of the seeds that real, really allowed me to want to get involved with politics and of course with people encouraging me. And I know even before I ran some time ago, I remember coming to seeing Harold Usher, must have been, it was two years ago or something like that. And he had me in his office and he was talking to me and we had a quick chat and 
I appreciate him for for taking that time. You know, he because he was the first uh, elected official in London who come who a black elected official in London, Ontario. So you know, of course, I remember when I was a kid because I'm I guess Harold maybe would still call me a kid. I'm not sure, but uh, <laughs> but Harold, Harold's a young guy. He's you see him sometimes running in council, literally uh, when he's trying to catch up on something or go grab a piece of paper from somewhere. He, he's pretty active. So um, you know, and so I kept dreaming, and then I dreamed the fact that maybe I could be a representative for Londoners and for people in Canada, and to bring perspective and to, to make a difference in my community and, and to do that thing that's different. And I dreamt about it and I said, okay, why not? Why not give it a shot? I had everything, I guess if you call it, made. I was, I was doing good. I was a public servant, making good money. I was working for a headquarters level. I was promoted a few times. And then I just kind of said to myself, I do have that sense of obligation to still continue to make a difference. So I, I, I took a leave of absence from work, so without pay, and kind of rolled the dice and did this thing, and, and I was very, uh, I was able to succeed. And I think just that drive uh, that I, I continue to have every single day, and just the fact that the people who were around me, who inspired me, really helped me push to get to where I was, uh, where I am today. So now, it's just like, okay, do I keep dreaming? Because, you know, I, I'm, I get to live that Canadian dream, and that Canadian dream is, is real, and anyone, if you talk to your children or anyone in the community or, you know, you as a frontline staff member who maybe deals with uh, immigrants or refugees on a day-to-day -day basis, I think it's, 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 you can tell people that you can be a refugee and come with literally nothing and be in a food bank line one day in Canada and the next day be down at City Hall and making decisions that impact, you know, almost 400,000 people, to me, is such an amazing opportunity. And I'm so proud of Londoners for giving me this opportunity. So thank you very much.